Okay, so uh, my name's Helen Parr, and I was the Community Engagement Officer for the BAT project. Uh, so some of you might know me from the project, for some of you this might be the first time that you're uh, coming to find out about the project. Uh, so I started on the pilot year of the project back in 2014, uh, seems like a long time ago now, and I wanted to share with you some of the community engagement highlights since that time. But before I talk about more about the project, I thought for those of you perhaps who aren't familiar with Great Horseshoe Bats, I'll just uh, show you a, a couple of slides with some photos and a little bit of info about the, the bat. So here's a few little facts about greater horseshoe bats. They, they're only a small mammal, uh, but they do have a life expectancy of up to 30 years, which is, is quite astonishing for such a small animal, uh, although the average tends to be lower than that in the wild. And, and weight wise, they only weigh about 34 grams, which is about six or seven teaspoons of uh, sugar, if you imagine that in your hand, very light. But they are one of our bigger uh, UK bats uh, with a wingspan when they're flying of around 40, uh, up to about 40 centimetres. So they're quite an impressive sight when you do catch a glimpse of them. Uh, and they love to eat, because they're quite a large bat, they love to eat moths, things like moths and beetles. And unlike the smaller pipistrelle type bats, which you might see flying around your garden at dusk at speed, uh, they just eat sort of smaller insects. But these like a, a, a bigger, a bigger morsel. Uh, and they don't like uh, to be disturbed by a lot of light or noise. And here, if you've never seen one close up or even far away, uh, most people are pretty surprised by when they first see that what they look like. So this is the the face of a greater horseshoe bat and the main feature that I think jumps out at you is its incredible nose and we call this a nose leaf uh, and it actually uses its nose you can just see its, its mouth uh, a little chin just sort of underneath the bottom there uh, and, and actually you can also see that ears uh, they're quite big ears there um, and the reason that they have this amazing nose leaf is to help enable them to do their echolocation so bats, um, as some of you may know, get around by echolocating. And um, a lot of bats do this by making sounds uh, with, from their mouth, but the horseshoe bats are different in that they actually emit these sounds from their nose. And the sounds, uh, the sound waves, the, the sound comes out of their nose and the waves bounce off whatever's around them. Uh, and they can build up a picture of where they are in the countryside. Uh, and also more importantly, or as importantly, where their food is so they can catch it. And all of our British bats, if uh, they only eat insects, that, that's what they feed on. And here's just a really fantastic image of a, a greater horseshoe bat in flight. Uh, and it, it shows the skeleton of the bat really fantastically. And the skeletons, the bones are all very similar to our human skeleton, but obviously they have adapted and they have these amazing long arms and, and very long fingers. And the bat, if you can see in, on the left there, it's scooping up a moth uh, into its wing and it'll then transport that into its uh, sharp teeth, uh, the, uh, its mouth. You can see that skull close up at the top, how sharp the little teeth are there. And then greater horseshoes, they, it's quite big. They can't eat it on the wing. So they'll go and hang upside down like in that small image at the top left there. Uh, and they'll munch off and drop all the crunchy bits of the wings and the casings of beetles and and eat the sort of protein rich body inside. So that's really just a whistle stop for <laughs> greater horseshoe bats. There's lots more information out there for people who want to find it. So the background to our project, the, the Devon Greater Horseshoe Bat Project, is that the population of greater horseshoe bats has declined by around 90% in the UK uh, in the last century. Uh, which is a huge decline and similar sort of trends are seen across the whole of Northern Europe and Devon's now uh, seen as a stronghold for the species. And so the project was uh, set up as a five year partnership project of 18 organisations, so um, lots of support from other organisations, and it was led by Devon Wildlife Trust, supported by the National Hot uh, Lottery Heritage Fund, uh, along with other funders. And so our vision was to secure the future of this uh, enigmatic and amazing bat in Devon. Uh, 
uh, as I said, the new Northern European stronghold of this mammal. And we did this, we had three main aims of the project. So the first aim was to work with landowners uh, to look at and improve habitats for bats uh, across the landscapes, uh, the countryside in Devon. Also to work with people, so that was my role on the project as community engagement officer to uh, raise awareness and show people about this amazing bat on their doorstep uh, and how it's such a sort of flagship species that if you've got greater horseshoe bats in your backyard or on your doorstep in, on the land around you, they, they show that the, the habitats are really good for lots of other species of uh, lots of wildlife. Uh, and our third aim was to improve our knowledge, uh, the science and the surveys side of things of greater horseshoe bats uh, and how they use the, the landscapes across the county. So this was the uh, some images of the bat project team. So if anyone who's been involved in the project will recognize some of the faces. Some people have come and gone over the years, but the, our, co our core of our team remain the same with a project manager, community engagement officers, two farm advice officers, and then later on uh, a Devon bat survey assistant to help us with all the vast amounts of data that we were collecting. So why involve people in the project? Well, the reason for involving uh, communities close to where the greater horseshoes live. So we focused on where the maternity roosts or the breeding roosts of the, these bats were, was to make sure that even after the project ended, awareness and activities would continue into the future. And, uh, and although we were focusing on greater horseshoe bats, uh, not only would they benefit from anything that was done in, uh, in the landscapes, other bat species would benefit along with other types of wildlife, uh, for example, such as insects, which is really important as that's their, their source of food. And during this time we ran uh, or supported or ran over 200 community events to, to do that awareness raising. And uh, here you can just see a couple of the walks and, and activities that we did. Communication was obviously really important and we, we made use of uh, our own website, so a separate website from Devon Wildlife Trust, uh, and, and I'll, uh, you'll be you can look at that now. It's still a live website uh, with with lots of resources for people to use and look at and find out more about the bats. And that's devonbatproject.org. Uh, and we had lots of people using the website. Um, we had a camera inside the roost. We've got films on there, um, and we've had through press releases and publicity, we were uh, we had interviews on BBC Radio Devon as well as Spotlight and even um, on one of the episodes of Country File. So it was a great way of uh, reaching out and getting, getting the message out there to people. And so yes, the website remains and on there you can find the films, some videos, and some games and lots of useful resources. And we hope this will be used into the future. Uh, right, so we also had what we call bat beacons, which were basically displays and, and other and touch screens, uh, interactive so, touch screens so people could find out more about the project. There were two permanent ones of these at, at Berry Head uh, no, um, and the Donkey Sanctuary uh, near Sidmouth, and they'll stay in place so people can continue to visit those. And then we also had three mobile versions, which uh, were set up, we could transport around and they were located in about 20 different places around the county. And again, the display panels from that will carry on being used um, uh, to continue to raise our awareness. Uh, and we also developed a series of walks, which can be downloaded from the website uh, to walk around the hub and see the habitats in these really fantastic sort of areas for that. Each year for, for five years, we had a, a September Bat Festival, which was a month where we try to have lots and lots of events for people to attend. There's just a few sort of images there from some of them. And that our project partners and, and community groups all came together and we offered a, a really a varied programme of events across the county, um, uh, varied events. So we had things like stands at events, we had uh, practical events, people could come along and do some practical conservation to help improve habitats, as well as sort of evening bat detecting walks. 
And then again, to share our knowledge, we arranged two conferences during the project. The first one, um, I think it was about three years ago now, was our Bats and Communities Conference. And that was aimed at people who can make a difference in championing, championing bats in their local communities. And we had a series of inspiring talks from professionals and local champions uh, aiming to equip uh, attendees with the knowledge and confidence to make their own village or town a bat friendly place to live. And then last year, in fact, it, it seems recent, but it was six months ago already, um, we held a two day uh, bat project conference, which we ended up having online for obvious reasons. And we again, we had a range of expert speakers and community representatives uh, covering the themes of research, roost, land management and communities. And, and the advantage of having it online in the end was that we recorded all the talks. And, and if you're interested, if you didn't attend or if you attend, you want to watch something again, you can view all of those talks on Devon Wildlife Trust's um, YouTube channel on the Bat Project Conference Talks playlist. And then we worked with communities in batty areas to, to make them a bat friendly. And so using by using bats as a focus, people there had been able to discuss and plan things in a joined up way to improve their local environment and create a bat friendly community. And we actually awarded as a plaque on the middle right there, uh, bat friendly community status to five communities across Devon for all of the amazing things that they'd achieved. And in, in this slide, you can just see a few uh, images at the bottom middle, there's a logo that was especially created in East Devon for the village of beer, bat friendly beer, not a drink, unfortunately. Um, and that helped to spread that message locally amongst different organizations. And in the bottom right, there's a, a bat garden, which was created to showcase how you could put insect friendly uh, plants in your garden and that would be good for the bats you're providing them with some prey and then in the, on the very bat group on the left there they got some funding from us to buy um, some bat detectors and they've got their high-vis jackets and they've been taking not last year so much unfortunately but they've been able to take people on bat detecting walks around the v tracy and they're now linking up with the town council to support tree planting and wildflower sowing so those are just some of the activities, but this is great that we've now handed some of that on to these communities. I hope you've got the knowledge to, to carry it forward and spread the message to others, hope maybe. Volunteers are integral to our projects, uh, being get in, uh, be it getting stuck into 60 practical events, learning new skills such as hedge laying and or scything, or helping with the Devon Bat Survey or other research surveys that we did. And the confidence and knowledge these volunteers have gained is a fantastic testament to the level of interest in the project uh, bodes well for the future with a, a massive 20,000 volunteer hours logged during the project which adds a, an enormous benefit to, to all of our work. We also ran training events, so 36 training events, so all sorts of skills, sharing knowledge such as how to run a bat walk and how to carry out bat data analysis. And then some of those events resulted in a number of volunteers gaining a, a recognised AQA qualification. Another big part of my work was delivering school activities. So I had um, many school activity sessions uh, and that engaged over five and a half thousand pupils over the project. Uh, and that doesn't count the about 850 school staff uh, that were involved. And then hopefully the children would go home and talk to their parents and and their other relatives about what they'd learned about the bats. So it's a great way of spreading the message. And then schools that work with us, uh, we we award rewarded them with a bat buddy award, bronze, silver, or gold levels. Uh, and we aim to try and fit the activities into the curriculum. So it's a brilliant way to get young people enthusiastic about bats and other wildlife. Uh, they're often really concerned about the climate emergency and this gives them some sort of power to do something locally where they can really make a difference to things. So that's it for me, a quick whistle stop tour of community engagement, but do visit our website for more information. I'm gonna hand over to Anna now to, to go take you through the, the farm advice work and the survey work. Uh, but to do that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then 
she will be able to share hers with you. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Helen. Um, I will now bring up my part of the talk, hopefully. There you go. Great. Okay. Um, hopefully you can all see that. Um, somebody shout if you can't. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm Anna. Um, for the final year of the Greater Horseshoe Back Project, I worked as the, um, the team leader. Um, but the, for, the, for the first four years of the project, I worked as one of the farm advisors. Um, so I'm going to cover sort of the aspects of the project, which sort of involved working with farmers, um, and then talking a bit more about the, uh, the research stream of the project, um, and also um, in more depth as well about the Devon Bat Survey, because I think possibly a few people who are attending the talk tonight might well have taken part in the Bat Survey, so it'd be great to be able to share some of the results uh, from that with you tonight. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, working with landowners, as Helen mentioned earlier, was a really big part of the Horseshoe Bat project. Um, and it was really great privilege to be able to go out and, um, you know, <laughs> walk through a lot of fields with farmers and drink a lot of tea around tables with uh, landowners and land managers and discuss greater horseshoe bats with them and actually really um, uh, promote why we think that they're important, what sort of habitats they look for and why they're special and, um, and really try and, and work out how best to manage a farm and, and how to sort of tweak some management practices that might already be good but could be improved on different sites that are really close to where we know that the greater horseshoe bats were breeding already. Um, so during the course of the Greater Horseshoe Bat Project, uh, we undertook 950 uh, separate landowner visits, um, which <laughs> does sound like a lot. And, and it was, we were constantly out and about um, talking to farmers and walking around sites and looking at different hedges and different areas where we know that bats might be able to make use of. Um, and influencing landowners was, was a really important thing for us because um, you know, quite often farmers will be receiving a lot of information from, from all over the place, um, but often we would be the only person who maybe has ever spoken to them about wildlife or um, in particular greater horseshoe bats. And so it's really important that we, be, that we were able to go out and spread that message in that way. Um, but we were also able to deliver workshops. So um, there's some great statistics here on this slide about how many workshops we actually managed to deliver. So 130 um, over the course of the last five years. So that was um, yeah, quite impressive, especially uh, when you think that the target that we actually had for that particular thing to deliver was only uh, 25 workshops. So we vastly outperformed <laughs> that particular target. So we were very happy with how many workshops we were able to, to deliver. And, and those would be covering all sorts of different topics. So that would vary from things like um, you know, species rich meadow restoration, woodland management, uh, parasite management, so the impacts of wormers on, on dung beetle populations, for example, um, and then things like countryside stewardship, how to access funding, um, all kinds of different topics. And some of them, you know, they weren't directly related to greater horseshoe bats, but actually by, by improving things like herbal lays, for example, on a farm, you'll be um, bringing in more insects, improving soil structure, and in, improving the farm in general for biodiversity, as well as greater horseshoe bats um, specifically. Um, and so by doing all of this sort of influencing work, um, the, the aim really is that that will then translate into an improved uh, habitat for greater horseshoes. Um, and as a result of the work that we undertook through the project, um, we know that at least 1,860 hectares of habitat has been improved. So that would be things like um, reducing the numbers of or the amount of um, fertilizer and pesticide being used on certain uh, land parcels and fields. Um, increasing the amount of uh, species rich grassland um, which is being restored and improving uh, the management of things like uh, woodlands which is uh, you know woodland edges and woodland rides really important for greater horseshoe bats. Um, one of the sort of main mechanisms for being able to deliver this work is through helping farms to access something called countryside stewardship funds um, and so if you're not familiar with that that is a sort of a subsidy based system that farmers can access used to be provided through the EU uh, Common Agricultural Policy, but now it's sort of changed to be a, a UK-based uh, subsidy system. Um, and through that process of being able to access those funds, we brought in um, just over £1.9 million worth of funding to farmers across Devon to help improve um, habitats on their farms. So it was quite a huge undertaking, really, and a lot of these uh, stewardship schemes were put together through the help of the project staff. 
um, and that has translated into these, these management changes. Um, alongside improving habitat in general, we really wanted to improve connectivity. So again, as Helen mentioned earlier, um, being able to uh, navigate through the landscape, really important for greater horseshoe bats. They've got that special nose leaf uh, structure, a bit like a parabolic satellite dish. Um, and it, it's, it, they can only produce quite a thin beam of echolocation, um, which means that if they don't have something to bounce their beam of uh, sound off, then they can get lost. So therefore, hedgerows, um, woodland edges, woodland rides, uh, sort of valley systems really important for them because without that kind of structure in the landscape they, they can't get to where they need to hunt. Um, so restoring hedges was really important, um, making sure that um, areas around river courses was well managed was also a really um, important target for us um, and also securing hedgerows in favourable condition was good too. So um, a lot of um, focus has been put on to actually planting hedges um, and that is actually something that we did through the project. We planted about seven kilometers of hedges, but also the management of hedges is really important too. So through the project, we managed to reduce the numbers of hedge cuttings that were taking place. So um, often from annual cuts to, uh, to only once every two or three years, for example, and that make, makes the, the hedges bushier and bigger. And so that's better for all wildlife, not just for greater horseshoe bats as well. So connectivity in the landscape um, has improved as a result of the of the work of the project. Um, so, but it wasn't just through these countryside stewardship schemes that we were able to um, sort of access funds to help farms to put into practice some of these habitat management um, um, actions. We also had uh, something called our Batworks Fund, and this was our capital work scheme that we had just for our project, and it was just under seventy thousand pounds worth of funding that we could put to various different undertakings um, across the project. So um, altogether, we uh, completed 63 of these capital work projects um, and they included things like orchard creation and restoration. Um, orchards are really important habitat for greater horseshoe bats as it sort of, it, it mimics like a woodland edge habitat and it allows them to echolocate off the trees but also access lots of food that would be um, sort of um, brought into this kind of traditionally managed habitat. So that was really great that we could help farmers to recreate and uh, restore those habitats. Um, and one of the great outcomes as well was increasing the number of roost sites that greater horseshoe bats could actually use. Um, so in the left hand side of the screen, you can see in the top corner there is a standalone roost that was created through the project. Um, and at the bottom left hand side, you can see it in progress before it was completed. Um, and this was um, put together with funding from our capital work scheme, but also through the AO&B in the east of Devon. Um, and within two weeks of this standalone roost being uh, completed, greater horseshoe bats had moved in. So it was really rewarding to know that the work that we put in and all the effort that we were going to was actually making a difference. Um, so it was great to have been able to access this funding and um, to be able to provide this help to farmers and landowners and community groups sometimes as well to be able to make a difference for bats um, on their farms or their land. Uh, we also helped to influence planners and development as well. Um, so this was quite a, an important thing for us to be able to do. Um, and through the work of the project, we've actually uh, managed to produce standalone advice for local planning authorities. So that they can uh, make sure that they're always using best practice to understand how greater horseshoe bats can be incorporated into planning decisions right from the start. Um, and we've also helped to uh, survey for the wildlife, county wildlife sites and designated new county wildlife sites. If you're not familiar with what a county wildlife site is, it's, a, it's, it's not a statutory recognised designation like a triple SI, um, but it is a site that if somebody is putting in a planning uh, permission application, for example, it does get flagged up and um, it increases our knowledge of how habitats are faring in, in Devon in general. So that was really great that we could contribute to that. So uh, moving on to the research aspect of the project. Um, so we've sort of looked a little bit at uh, what we did with landowners, um, also working um, with research organisations and improving our understanding of greater horseshoe bats was really important to the project. And we were lucky to um, actually be able to work alongside a PhD student, firstly um, based at Exeter and then moved up to Sussex University. Um, and we were able um, through the project to, to be able to really help him to um, 
survey firstly and the areas that we knew were well used by bats and have access to some of the, um, uh, the, the landowners that we're working with to be able to cite some of these detectors that he was putting out into the landscape. In this bottom left hand corner you can see um, a little uh, snapshot of some of the work that he had done. So this is a little image of his uh, connectivity um, circuitscape project that he put together which is like a predictive modeling software to help understand how bats use the landscape. So he was basically testing this theory that he could use this model to help uh, local planning authorities and other people who are interested in how development in a landscape might impact on the movement of animals such as greater horseshoe bats through the landscape and that hopefully using this software in the future planners can better understand that if for example uh, development went in one location it might have more impact than if it went in, a, in another location um, so it has got a real scope to be used on a wider scale um, through the work that was done for this PhD through the project so it's really great to have been involved with that but possibly the most um, widely known part of the research aspect of the Greater Horseshoe Bat Project was the Devon Bat Survey. Um, and you can see in this map here, um, this is you can see Devon, um, and across Devon, we've got all of these little squares of various colors. And these squares represent where surveys took part through the Devon uh, Bat Survey. Um, and throughout the last five years, we've actually managed to survey almost 20% of the available sort of one kilometer square grid um, grid uh, slots available across the county and, and Devon is a, is a big county so it's, it's quite an amazing survey effort that has taken part through the work of the Devon Bat Survey um, and that is about 1,387 of these survey squares uh, which are each a kilometre square um, and so all together through all of that work we've uh, collected 3.8 million sound files um, through the work of over 2,500 volunteers so it was a very large uh, undertaking for the project. And I think at the start, none of us really fully understood just how big a part of the project this was going to be, um, which, um, but it was amazingly successful. But, and I'll just explain the steps as well for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So um, in the right hand side here, you can see a map of Devon again, and these blue little labels represent where some of the host centers were. So the way it worked was we would put out these bat detectors that you can see in the left hand side, this is us um, getting all these bat detectors ready to go out to these host centers at the start of each survey season. Um, we would deliver these bat detectors to these locations. So the host centers might be at a garden center or a community center or a swimming pool in some instances. Um, and then a volunteer would click on a square that they want to survey. They'd go to their nearby host center. They'd pick up their bat detector. They'd put it out in their garden or wherever, just like in the picture in the middle here. Um, and then they would collect it back up again after about four days, return it to the host center, email us, sorry, um, post us the SD card that they have all the data that had been gathered during that time. Then we would analyze that data um, using software, which is very useful that we had this software because it meant that we could do it automatically in most cases. Um, and then we would email back to the volunteer a report, um, such as you can see here, and they would be able to find out exactly you know, what species were found on this bit of land that they'd surveyed, how many were found, and a little bit of information about the species as well. So, um, and then you know, the bat detector would go back to the host centre and it would, the whole process would repeat again. And that happened um, almost 1,400 times <laughs> over the last five years. And that was, um, uh, yeah, so a lot of work. So we actually um, had to bring in um, an extra member of staff to help us cope with the, the huge kind of work that, workload that that involved. But it was really worth it because we generated huge amounts of extra information about bat species across Devon. Um, so here is a map of the greater horseshoe bat results. So this is information gathered over the whole of the five years of the bat survey. Um, the dark purple squares are where we found greater horseshoe bats and then the light purple are where surveys took, part, took place um, but greater horseshoes weren't found. Um, and we found that over 50, like over 50 percent of the surveys actually did find greater horseshoe bats, which was uh, you know a little bit unexpected in a way. That was a, a lot of the site. So it just goes to show how important Devon really is for greater horseshoe bats. Um, and also this this sort of data gathering exercise of the Devon bat survey actually doubled the number of records that the greater that the um, Devon Biodiversity Record Center holds for greater horseshoe bats. So um, over the course of 
you know, the last 70 years or so, the Devon Biodiversity Records Centre have been holding information about where bats are in, in Devon. But over the course of just the last five years, we've, we've doubled that information. And it just goes to show how useful and how important citizen science projects like this can be for gathering data on a really large scale. But it wasn't just greater horseshoe bats that we were trying to find information about. Um, so this map is representing Barbersfell uh, survey results as well. Barbersfell bats are one of the, uh, you know, equally rare, if not rarer, bat species in Devon. Um, and in this map, you can see the red squares that represents new uh, records for Barbersfell bats. Um, and the blue squares show where we already had records for Barbersfell bats before the Devon bat survey. Um, so it, it's a quite a nice way of representing just how much extra information we now have about this species in Devon as a result of all the effort that the volunteers have gone to and the other uh, success of the project. Um, the purple dots, if you're wondering, are where we've actually um, got a new record for an already existing uh, survey square for Barbersville bats. So, um, like, incredibly, we've actually increased the, the uh, data for Barbersville bats in Devon by 800% over the last five years. Um, in the Devon Bat Survey report, which you can find on the Devon Bat Project website, um, you can find a lot more information and there, there are loads of other pretty maps that you can have a look at and um, it's, it's quite nice to just have a look and, and just see how much data we've actually managed to collect and, and have a look through and see how you can have a look at how, um, you know, maybe some bats you only find at certain times of the night, etc. Um, and you can have a look at the, uh, the survey report to find out a bit more information. So this is just a real overview of what we found. Um, so this is Barbersell again, and I just wanted to show you know, some, sometimes the distribution of where we're finding bats is interesting too. So there seems to be quite a strong correlation for barber cells and the coastline, for example. And this information we fed back to other conservation organizations that are looking at doing barber cell bat uh, projects in the future too. And finally, um, I just wanted to finish on this graph as well, or this table, I should say, um, because I think a lot of people who are possibly at this talk um, and, and you know, a lot of people in Devon will be living in urban areas. And it's quite easy to dismiss those areas as not important for bats. But one of the things that came out of the Devon Bat Survey, because most people who took part wanted to find out what was in their garden, was that urban areas are actually really important for some of the rarer species of bat that we find in Devon. So on this table, you can see information for greater horseshoe bats, barber cells, and lesser horseshoe bats. And yes, it is true that you find them in greater numbers outside of urban areas, but actually even within the cities of Plymouth, Torbay and Exeter, there are surprisingly high numbers of these uh, bat species that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find. And when we looked a bit closer into the data, it did become quite apparent that it would be, for example, strips of gardens along terraces, um, sort of darker areas in cities, parks, um, tree lines, and that kind of thing actually provided a really important um, area for these bats to be able to still access gardens where people might be actually planting really important species that might be um, bringing in insects from all over that the bats can then access. So I wanted to leave on this little message as well that yes, we've been working all across Devon and working a lot with farmers and, and all these rural areas, but people in their own gardens can make a big difference. And the information that we got from the Devon Bat Survey really supported that. Um, so that was a, a really nice message to be able to put out to people as well. So that's basically the whittle stop tour <laughs> of the Greater Horseshoe Bat project. Um, so thank you to all of our, um, our partners and to all of the funders as well that took part and also to people like yourselves who took part in the survey, came to events um, and generally supported Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, so that, that's everything. <laughs> I'll hand back to Zoe and I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Anna. That was really, really interesting. And I think just it goes to show that you guys smashed so many brilliant targets and just sort of the impact of the project is just fascinating um, in such a sort of seemingly short period of time. Um, as you can imagine, we've got a few questions, but if obviously people do have questions and comments, please feel free to put them in the chat as we go. Um, We'll probably sort of open up the questions to both Anna and Helen, because um, they'll sort of come from different sort of parts of the project. So the first question is quite a long one and actually applies to both of you. 
So with the project finishing, is there any way to monitor or check the new hedges or improved habitat are still well maintained and bat numbers are increasing? And from the community engagement aspect, what were some of people's reactions, thoughts about the species, their level of value towards animals before and after the project? So I think the first question um, probably goes to you, Anna. So if you want to answer that one. Um, yes, yeah, so I think just to <laughs> um, recap the question, so it was basically about how we are still being able to monitor um, the successes of the project, uh, you know, beyond the funding. Um, and that is always a challenge, um, as I'm sure everyone is aware. Um, but luckily, because Devon Wildlife Trust had kind of built that into um, the original bid, we knew that we wanted to be able to take that forward into the future as well. So current projects that are at the beginning of, of starting now, so for example, the um, uh, Devon, Saving Devon's Treescapes project will be using the bat detectors that we use through the Devon Bat Survey to try and work out how um, you know, their work is being improved, um, how, how their work is influencing uh, bats, I should say. The um, Working Wetlands project or Upstream Thinking project has also got greater horseshoe bats as one of their key species, so they will be using the detectors to be sort of monitor what we've been doing. Um, and also beyond, um, the, the end of the project, we will be going back and actually looking at some of the sites that we've helped to fund as well. So we, we know that we're going to go back. It, it's hard to say for sure, just by using detectors that it's having a positive impact. But we know that if the, the hedges are still there, the roosts are still there, then it is going to be something that's going to be beneficial for wildlife in general into the future. Um, and then lastly, roost sites that we have created or restored, um, they will be monitored by bat workers. So we know that they will continue to be monitored in, into the future. Fantastic. And for you, Helen, uh, with the sort of community aspect, yeah. um, what were people's reactions and sort of did you see a change before and after the project? Yeah, yeah, we did, because I think a lot most people that we initially spoke to, they'd never even heard of a greater horseshoe bat. So they might have seen a bat in their garden, but that was maybe as far as it went. So um, just showing, especially with younger people in schools, showing them those sort of images of the bat and what it actually looks like close up was always a real surprise to people because because they're nocturnal. We just don't know, even studying them and surveying the surveys, it's, it's quite difficult to do because they're only out in the dark. So you have to get around that in some way. So, yeah, by sharing that sort of information and like some of the videos from inside the roost that are on our website, um, we could anecdotally, yeah, I could say yes, I'm, and I would perhaps meet people at one event and then meet them later and, and in schools and you could see that they were like, oh yeah, they're the bats with the no horseshoe shaped nose and we should have said that's why they're called the greater horseshoe bat because they've got that horseshoe shape on their nose. And so it was really nice to see that. And also people to say, change that perception of people who thought of oh, bats are scary or that they're vampires and all that kind of thing uh, and then the difference between the different species and how you can start to look, look at the shape and where they're flying and where they're hunting and perhaps learn to identify them and how people could actually help so we can all help bats in a really simple way just by attracting more insects into our gardens that's probably enough <laughs> no that's very really interesting um the next sort of question is probably aimed at you, Anna. Um, so were any significant new roosts found as a result of the survey? Well, uh, <laughs> yes and no. So um, as a result of the survey, and if you go into the devonbatproject.org website and then you look at our survey report, you can see some information in some of those maps that really show hotspots for, um, for greater horseshoes, but barber cells and lesser horseshoes as well. So, so what we did um, to try and drill down into the data a little bit further was find out where there were higher numbers of passes just after sunset than you would otherwise expect from you know, any sort of normal part of the, of the countryside where you might get one or two greater horseshoe bats flying past. So we know that greater horseshoes emerge about 10 minutes after sunset. And so if we are looking at what we have found within like half an hour after the sunset, we know that the horseshoe bats must have come from somewhere quite nearby. And so through doing that and through using the data from the Devon Bat Survey, we've found some real hotspots where we didn't know existed before. Um, so in some cases, it, it's up to, you know, 
500 or so calls <laughs> during a survey, which is a huge number of calls. So, so we know that if there are that many calls, like not long after sunset, there has to be a roost site nearby. And so what we're doing is we're working with various organizations and looking at how we can then go back to those landowners and then talk to them further. And so that is something that we're hoping we can continue to build on through the Devon Bat survey, um, but also through the general work of the Bat project too, like going out and talking to farmers that quite often they'd say, come and look at my barn. Like, I think I might have something here. And then you'd go in and be like, oh, blimey. And then you've got all these bats here. No, no one knew that before. And they didn't think that it was that interesting. And so just being able to go out there and, and just kind of discuss it with them, you can say like, oh, well, this is great to keep it you know, undisturbed and make sure that you can try and keep it as dark as you can. And, um, and then you can go back and make a record that that exists and, and therefore people will know that into the future. So yeah, so there's kind of a, a case of both things really, Devon Bat survey, but also the work, the wider work of the project. Fantastic, so lots to improve on and lots of successes. Um, the next question is, what would you like what would you have done differently knowing what you do know now so i guess this is both to both of you so i guess anna if you want to start oh uh, well <laughs> i think as i alluded to in the talk the devon bat survey uh, was quite a lot of work <laughs> so um i think we've all as a team said that if you know if this was to be done again it would have been good to get in um eleanor parry who was our survey assistant um from the start because that would have meant that it would have been a lot easier so some people who took part might not have received their report uh, straight away, for example. And I think that, you know, hopefully that has become, uh, the reason for that has become obvious, <laughs> um, that there was a, a lot of data that we were getting our way through. Um, so that's probably something that, that we would have done differently. Um, we've also produced an end of project report and we've actually um, created a whole table of various things that we would recommend. Um, but I'll pass over to Helen to see if she's got anything in particular as well. Well, I mean, I obviously agree on the Devon Bat survey that I, that was just a massively sort of successful and popular part of the project. So that's not something that I'd change particularly, but yeah, that to resource that as best we can to get as much coverage as possible. Um, apart from that, I haven't really got much. I mean, in terms of just delivery, the having those bat beacons was quite uh it was great to have the materials to get out to people and ongoing it'll be good to have that but the logistics of sort of getting stuff moved all around the county to different venues was was quite time consuming but i mean that's just one of those things and it, it worked and it was quite hard we've managed we've evaluated we had to evaluate all the parts of the project but it's quite hard to evaluate people that visited those and how good it was so i don't know how how effective it was but hopefully it's useful and we've got some good materials sort of going forward and also uh, as well as thinking about things that would have changed it was really good to think about what worked really well and there were a lot of things that did but one thing that everyone has agreed on is that being a partnership project was really beneficial so as Helen said at the start there were 18 partners and that is a lot and that can be quite tricky to you know get everybody in the same room at the same time and to get everyone to talk but actually uh, a criticism of conservation organizations can be that we don't necessarily work together um, and by using the model that the BAP project had of bringing everybody together from the very start and making it a partnership project was really great and I think everyone who's been involved has sort of said you know that this is the way that we should do it so that was and great. The, the other great thing about that it means that although the project all these project funding come to an end uh, but all those partner organisations, such as all the area of outstanding natural beauty teams around the county, they, they've got that knowledge sort of embedded now in what they do, and they can continue to sort of spread the word rather than everything just some, coming to a grinding halt, which would be no good for the bat because all these changes need to be long term to be really successful. Yeah, I can certainly say that the collaborations were certainly amazing to see and the fact that there were so many organisations involved is, is such a um, special instance. Um, the next question is, can seed for the bats be grown in areas without much sun? Is clover useful and what plants or flowers can be grown in our garden to attract greater horseshoe bats? Uh, I, well, I'd say a bit about things that you grow in your garden. Um, I mean, a lot of 
uh, we've got again we've got more information on our website about that so in the resources section of our website there's a download of a booklet that we created which has a, a plants that are good for uh, night pollinators of the moths but generally any sort of native wildflower sort of plant um, like lavender or honeysuckle uh, or things like that that not not so much bedding type plants because they don't really they're not really good for insects but those kind of plants are really good for butterflies in the daytime and then moths at night time so you, you can't really go wrong and also there are other lists of things uh, on the Bat Conservation Trust website. Uh, if you're interested in bats, they're the national charity for bats. They're one of our partners and they have um, lots of information about things you can plant in your garden that are good for pollinators and things like the Royal Horticultural Society as well. They've got lots of stuff about plants that are good for pollinators. So it's just keeping and, and having your garden, I mean, there's a really good campaign actually, Action for Insects, which is a Devon Wildlife Trust uh, campaign, where you can look, find that on their website, and that has got lots more information about uh, helping insects, which obviously in turn is really helpful for bats, because if they haven't got any insects, they haven't got any food. Uh, I don't know, do you know about clover, Amara? Um, yeah, I don't know whether it's particularly beneficial to night flying insects. Um, I, yeah, sorry, I can't really comment on clover in particular, I'm afraid. Perhaps it's one of, on one of the lists or many resources that we can find on these websites. Um, the next question is to do with lighting. So Honiton is changing the streetlights to LEDs, which are a lot dimmer than the old type. Do you think this will be helpful for bats? Um, so one of the research uh, papers that was written up by our uh, PhD student Finch was looking at the impact of lighting and different lighting types on bats. And I believe that his paper isn't quite published yet or it's, it's on the cusp of being published or might have just been published. <laughs> um, I'll have to have another little chat with him. Um, but that was something that we, we did look at. Um, and it, it seems like that it, it can be better, but I think it is it's also quite a, a tricky and complex picture, <laughs> which is always seems to be the answer when it comes to these sorts of questions. Um, but certainly reducing the, um, you know, the numbers of lights is really important. Um, and when we had a look at our Devon Bat survey results as well, there was a really negative correlation between people who said that you know, they'd undertaken a survey near streetlights and people who'd found greater horseshoe bats and the, the sort of the rarer bat species. So we do know that, that it has a negative impact, but um, yes, when it, when it comes to the individual different types of lighting, there's lots of mixed messages, I think. So some papers might have found that actually there's not much difference and some papers might be finding something different. So um, it's, it's complex, I think is the, the answer. So who, who knows in, in, you know, in terms of Honiton what, what the implications are? We'll be eagerly waiting his um, paper then when it's published or if it's published. Um, the next question is, um, my brother lives in Luden, Ludown. Sorry if I've mispronounced it. Um, can I volunteer him for anything? And did you find anything of batty interest near him? I'm not sure where Ludown is. It's spelled L-E-W down, if that helps. I'm not sure where that is. I mean, in terms of volunteering, though, we because the project's ended there's no volunteer opportunities but I know that Devon Wildlife Trust has a section on volunteering correct me if I'm wrong they on their website where you can sign up to receive information on volunteer opportunities obviously at the moment with the way things have been over the last sort of year the volunteering opportunities have been limited but hopefully come the spring and summer there'll be more things going on but um, if you're interested in bats in Devon then, um, Devon Bat Group, who are another partner on the project, might be worth looking at their website and joining Devon Bat Group. I know they have meetings and talks and they go out on walks and, and surveys and they do counts of emergence counts of bat roofs and things like that. So that might be a good way of getting involved. Fantastic. And on a sort of similar note, the next question is, I'm currently a student studying animal behaviour I'm curious on what your career journeys were to get where you, you are now and as I was interested in a similar job role. So I think that probably goes to both of you. Shall I go first? Yeah, so um, yeah, so I'm not a bat specialist. <laughs> I've started, I used to work for the 
the Woodland Trust. So I'm a general conservationist, I guess, uh, and that was woodland management and working with volunteer groups. And then I uh, did more and more environmental education with them and getting school groups out planting trees and, uh, and doing educational activities around the environment. Uh, and so when this role came up, community engagement, then uh, those all those things sort of came together and that was kind of how I ended up and that's why when I talk to people I said you know that oh, I don't know anything about bats I can't teach other people and I say well you, you you know you can learn and I I knew about bats generally but it's been really fascinating over the last few years to really specialize in one one animal and, and learn so much about it so it's been a, a real privilege yeah, similar to me, really. So um, I've worked for Wildlife Trusts now since 2012, so <laughs> coming on for almost a decade. Um, and I think that, yeah, the, fir the first one was looking at uh, farm advice. So I have sort of worked in the field of farm advice, really, for most of my career. Um, and getting into, into that was um, sort of possibly a little bit of volunteering. Um, I did a, an MSc in conservation and land management as well and sort of focus on the impacts of environmental schemes, so agri-environment schemes, and that's how I sort of got into the farm advisory work. And, and that's quite an interesting field to be involved in, especially with everything that's changing at the minute with agricultural policy, um, you know, coming out of the cap and the EU and how things are, are changing for, for good or for bad, who knows, it's all so, so up in the air. Um, but it's it's certainly an area where it sort of um, there there are quite a few jobs I suppose um, and so it has been a really interesting thing for me and then um, that's how I got into the the back project so as a farm advisor um, and as Helen I you know I wasn't a specialist in bats so it's been really great to you know spend a lot of time learning about that species and that group of species um, and then yeah here we are <laughs> five years down the line. Fantastic. That's helpful in some way. I think so. I think it's it's useful to show that you can come from anywhere really and not necessarily have, as you say, bats bat specific knowledge. Um, and also um, I just thought out of interest, people, uh, we we both, Anna and I still we do have now some an ongoing different role within the wildlife trust. So we haven't been <laughs> thrown out on <laughs> thrown out on the streets just yet. <laughs> we wouldn't throw you out. <laughs> Uh, to what extent is cooperation of landowners and farmers key, key to the success of this project? Um, it's, it's massively important. So without that, we wouldn't have been able to, you know, do any of the, the sort of the outcomes that I discussed in terms of habitat management and habitat gains. Um, and it, it's, a, it's an interesting one because a lot of the farmers that we engaged with, I mean, we had our project areas around where we knew the maternity roost sites were. So we'd sort of narrowed down our field of where we were going to focus. Um, but it, it included a lot of, you know, cold calling, writing letters, phoning up people um, and just kind of like knocking on doors and, and yeah, putting letters and leaflets in through doors. Um, but as soon as a farmer kind of has said, yes, I'm happy to have a site visit, you know that it's already going well because he's not going to, or she's not going to give up their time um, unless they're sort of interested already. Um, and I know our, our farmers can get a lot, a lot of rap at the minute, um, but what we found is that they're really engaged with it, really interested, and, and the vast majority really wanted to do what was beneficial for the greater horseshoe bats and really interested in finding out more. Um, but it was great to be able to access some of these um, agri-environment schemes as well, because, you know, they are farm businesses and so they have to come at it from a business perspective as well. And so being able to access funding that can actually help them to undertake some of these land management changes was really important. And so I'm hoping that, you know, in the future that that continues through these new agri-environment schemes that are going to come on board through these sort of, um, the elms they're called. Um, so yeah, so the collaboration of the farmers was, was really vital, so working with them as much as possible um, was, was definitely key, <laughs> and being able to, to run those workshops was brilliant because, um, you know, we could bring in sometimes expert speakers on various other subjects, so I sort of mentioned about herbal lays, for example, and that's good for insects, but it's also really good for, like, um, soil structure, um, uh, drought resistance, so, you know, deeper tap roots and some of the species that you'd find in those more varied swards means that they can access water from lower down in the, in the soil and the water table, as opposed to like ryegrass 
um, lays, which is sort of more traditional thing that you'd find in fields. So, um, so that helps in terms of the farm business as well. So we really have to look at it in terms of what helps them as well as what helps bats, because that's your foot in the door. Um, so just trying to think about it in terms of what, what works for the farmers as well as what we're trying to do was, was important for collaborating. Fantastic. Now, obviously, I think we've gone a bit over time, but I am going to just ask one more question because I think it's sort of on a similar line, but more towards sort of Helen's line of work. Um, how receptive are local councils to adapt or change green spaces based on this project to help bats? Yeah, I think um, with the community sort of groups that we've worked with, that has varied from um, groups to do link with the council or separate from the council. So it's depend on the different areas. But um, a lot of uh, councils now, the climate action thing is really big. So get, to get all those messages out there and then they are really now becoming really receptive because there are often within town councils, there are environment groups now and they're, and they're completely focusing on improving the environments. And there's a lot more, um, certainly in Exeter and Plymouth, there's a lot going on with about around reducing cutting and spraying of verges and allowing you know sowing wildflowers and just allowing it all to become wilder and so much better for insects the Plymouth Council found that they stopped because of lockdown and everything last year they they reduced by like 80 percent their cutting and the effect for wildlife was brilliant and so now a lot of it is about getting the message out there to people who say oh it's messy but actually explaining why why it's being done and it's sort of a win-win situation because it's good for wildlife uh, it's good not to put chemicals down um, and it saves money for the councils which is going to be key isn't it in the, in the next few years fantastic thank you and i just want to say a really big thank you to everyone who's attended tonight and to our speakers um, for taking the time obviously the bat project has ended sadly now um so thank you for taking that sort of extra bit of time to really kind of um, celebrate the project and conclude it in a really nice way. Um, as Helen, Helen and Anna mentioned, obviously there are lots of resources still available, both on the Devon Bat Project, um, which is devonbatproject.org, but also our own website, which will try and keep updated as much as possible with sort of relevant resources as well. Um, I just wanted to say on sort of Helen's last note about sort of action and sort of climate change and things like that, that there is currently the new environment bill going through Parliament and based on the sort of recent state of nature reports, um, we really need to sort of assess sort of what impacts we have on nature and basically put the recovery of nature into law. So that new environment bill is sort of going on at the moment. And we, the Wildlife Trust and 50 plus all other organisations have teamed up to create this petition to essentially tell the government that this environment bill is crucial for nature's recovery and that we need to sort of put to, like proper targets into law so you can find that petition link on our website as well so that's obviously key for bats and all sorts of other wildlife in terms of sort of the future of sort of the wildlife in Devon and the UK and obviously the world as well um also just a bit of a plug though so there's a, obviously other online events going on in the next or few months um the next one is our Bring Beatles Back or Bring Back the Beatles, um, uh, led by John Walters. And that is on the 25th of March. And you can find that on our website as well. So another big thank you to our speakers and to our um, attendees. And I'd just like to say good evening and hope you all have a pleasant night and sort of rest of the week. Thanks, Mary. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone.